SEAM, SEG Advanced Modeling Corporation. What is SEAM? It's a collaborative industrial research effort dedicated to large-scale, leading-edge geophysical modeling and numerical simulation. A unique research partnership between SEG and the geophysical community. I am Manik Tawani. I'm chairman of the SEAM Board of Governors. And I'd like to say a few words about what SEAM is, what SEAM has accomplished, what it is doing now, and our plans for the future. SEAM provides a forum for industry leaders to discuss geophysical problems of common interest. It advances the art of modeling and computation by stimulating research and development. And it provides data sets for industry benchmarks and educational purposes. SEAM research projects are conducted in phases. Each phase is conducted by an industry consortium assembled around a geophysical challenge of great current relevance. It lasts, each phase does, for about two or three years. SEAM phase one focused on the development of a geophysical model for a deep water region containing a large salt body and carried out subsequent simulation of geophysical attributes over the model. What were these attributes? Simulations included acoustics, gravity, control source, CSEM, elastic, and magnetotelluric responses. All simulations are now complete. The data obtained are now available to other than the participants who financially contributed to the project. The SEAM Phase II Consortium, uh, we, term it, we are terming it Land Seismic Challenges, started in 2011. It's constructing three digital geologic models for 3D numerical simulations of land seismic exploration. These models are the unconventional model, the arid model, the foothills model. Let me describe the model a little more. The unconventional model contains shale reservoirs modeled with elastic properties of the Eagle Ford and Woodford shale gas plays and placed in the stratigraphic setting of a mid-continent basin such as the near surface and overburden of Arcoma Basin. The arid model contains the same reservoirs and overburden as the unconventional model, but replaces the first 500 meters of the near surface with structures such as cars, wadis, and outcropping bedrock often encountered in desert terrains. The foothills model contains complex structural features of fold and thrust belts, overlaid by the highly heterogeneous near surface and rough topography of foothills regions. The type area for the foothills model is the Llanos Basin of Colombia. All models were constructed with the help of many of the participating company personnel. All the models are in the final stages of completion and we expect to complete all simulations by the end of 2014. Uh, we hope to launch a new phase, Phase 3 SEAM, in 2015. A number of topics are under discussion for a Phase 3 SEAM project. Uh, these include poor pressure prediction in a deep water subsalt environment, interpretation workbox of a 3D data cube containing integrated geological geophysical data set, Reservoir management, pre-stack and post-stack seismic simulation of complex reservoir geology and dynamic conditions intended to challenge interpretation techniques. Constructing and interpreting geophysical signatures of various scenarios of mineral deposit systems. We at SEAM invite you to suggest to us which of these projects would be of interest to you or if you have ideas about other possible projects. Thank you very much. Formed in 2007, SEAM is a separately incorporated subsidiary of SEG, governed by its own board of directors. List of 2013 SEAM board of directors with their year term expires. Manik Talwani, Chair, 2013. Kevin Bishop, Vice Chair, 
2014. Jesse Perez, Treasurer, 2013. Sheldon Briner, 2013. Henri Houlevé, 2014. Ya Gua Lee, 2014. Kamal Al Yaya, 2015. Steve Danbaum, 2015. Scott Morton, 2015. SEAM projects are managed by technical project managers in conjunction with the management committees made up of participant representatives. Michael Failer, Phase 1 Project Manager, Senior Research Scientist at Massachusetts Institute of Technology. You can reach him at michael.failer at gmail.com. Michael Oristaglio, Phase 2 Project Manager, Senior Research Scientist at Yale University. You can reach him at michael.oristaglio at yale.edu. SEAM produces results, a forum that promotes industrial collaborations, regular update articles in the leading edge, final report series on SEG ebooks, and SEAM models and data sets. SEAM is proactively accelerating geophysical technologies. SEAM has a proven track record of producing results that are of high value to the participants. SEAM provides benchmarking tools for industry and teaching tools for academia to train the next generation of seismic processing and imaging experts. SEAM datasets provides users with the tools to test algorithms for imaging and inversion, better understand features and artifacts in real images, explore trade-offs in acquisition methodologies, and train the next generation of seismic processing and imaging experts. It is important for the industry to be able to take the next steps from simple to more complex geological models, and SEAM plays a key role in this process, by John Rasmussen of EMGS. Current SEAM Projects Phase 1 Challenges of Subsalt Imaging in Tertiary Basins with Emphasis on Deepwater Gulf of Mexico. Phase 2. Land Seismic Challenges, Thrust Model, Arid Model, and the Unconventional Model. Phase 3. Coming in 2015. Want to learn more? Visit www.seg.org slash seam or email seam at seg.org. The SEAM project has created data sets we can exchange with academia and across the industry for external benchmarking. By Henri Houlevé, Total. Available now. The SEAM Phase 1 model and data are now available to the general public for license. For more details, please visit www.seg.org. I'd like to describe a little bit about the SEAM Phase 1 project, which is now complete. And the title of the SEAM Phase 1 project is Using Simulation to Address Challenges of Subsalt Imaging in Tertiary Basins with Emphasis on Deepwater Gulf of Mexico. This project started in early 2007 and recently just completed all of its work um, in the middle of, of 2013. The project lasted quite a while because we not only started with the SEAM Phase 1 project, but we were successful in getting some support from RIPSI, uh, the Research Partnership to Secure Energy for America, to continue the project um, beginning about four years ago, which added substantially to the amount of work that we could do as part of the SEAM Phase One project. The goal of the SEG Advanced Modeling Project overall, which is what was initially um, developed to and, and facilitated the startup of SEAM Phase One, was to use numerical simulation to look at ways to reduce exploration and development risk um, by improving geophysical methods. And the idea was to develop relevant and challenging data sets um, using simulation uh, that would allow um, uh, users of the data sets to test things like acquisition design, new imaging methods, and joint in, uh, inversion methodologies. But another goal was to advance the state of the art of numerical simulation because the sense was that in the geophysical community, geophysical simulation should be more widely used as a way of, of testing and de um, developing methods um, and showing how well they work um, to help advance the state of the art of geophysical imaging. So specifically, how did SEAM Phase 1 go about the project? 
Um, initially, we developed an Earth model that was representative of a deep water Gulf of Mexico region, and you can see the dimensions there. It was quite large, um, and we gridded the model and originally on a 10 by 10 by 10 meter grid, but for subsequent simulations after the first acoustic simulation, we gridded it on a 20 by 20 by 10 meter um, grid. We then used numerical simulation to generate data sets, and the goal was that the, the numerically simulated data sets would look like real field data, uh, which is a big challenge to, to try to put enough heterogeneity into the model to make the data look real. Um, we wanted to use state-of-the-art simulation codes, and we wanted to validate that those state-of-the-art simulation codes were actually providing us something that was um, representative of what the real Earth looked like. And the idea at the time was to oversample, um, at least in the, in the um, um, receiver domain, the data so that, they, the, so that various acquisition designs could be tested. This is a perspective view of the SEAM Phase I model. This was provided by Christoph Stork from Landmark. Um, and this, this shows the, the salt body, mainly that the colored portion is the salt body that, that um, sort of dominates the SEAM Phase I deep water model. And you can see some of the, um, the layering that sits around the salt body. This is um, including not only the layering, but some of the imaging that Christoph did um, using the, the SEAM data. The scope of work for the SEAM Phase I model was originally not only to develop the model, but to simulate a, a, an acoustic acquisition on the model. And, and we completed that, and then um, subsequently we got support from REPSI, as I said earlier, that allowed us to extend the Earth model to be fully elastic and to be anisotropic. Um, so we, we included shear velocity and resistivity, and that allowed us to do not only elastic simulation, but TTI simulation, um, as well as gravity and electromagnetic simulations that included controlled source EM and magnetotoleric simulations. This is a simplified view, cross-sectional view of the SEAM model, just showing the, 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 the basic structural elements of the model. The big red uh, feature in there is the salt body. Um, the salt body has a, um, a um, top of the salt that's, that's heterogeneous, um, meaning it has some entrapped sediments in it. There's also a suture in the salt body that I think is number uh, 14 that's not quite shown in this figure. Um, but you can also see then the other layers, um, starting with the water at the top and going down uh, to the, the bottom layer, which is the one that's shown in blue, which is the, salt, the, the feeder stock for the salt body. Around this, we built heterogeneity, and we tried to build the heterogeneity um, using a geologic approach, and it's uh, shown in this slide, which was put together by Joe Stephanie, who was um, one of the people who was really instrumental in building the SEAM Phase I model. And the, the idea behind the building of the model was to, de, to de start from the, geology, from the geology and the petrophysics and, and then and define rock properties, things like V-shale, porosity, the kinds of fluids, which are shown in the left box, and then from those to, de, to derive the geophysical parameters, such as VP, VS, density, uh, the anisotropy parameters, the uh, resistivity parameters. Um, and the, the goal of doing it this way was to try to come up with something that was geologically consistent so the parameters could, would, were related in a geological consistent sense. Once that was done, the idea of seam was to continue on to the right box and generate the geophysical response, which is shown as seismic waves. Um, we might develop an attenuation or dispersion, um, thinking of the, also the EM response and gravity. The part of the, the work that SEAM Phase 1 did not want to address but wants to leave to those who use the data are shown in the bottom, where the data are used to test various parameters like ABO, um, some, any kind of inversion, um, or uh, um, to try to determine elastic properties. So SEAM's goal was to work on the top, the top two arrows, and generate data that could be used by users to, to work down on the bottom, to go back from the geophysical response on the right side to the... Um, geological response on the left side. The model properties were derived using as, as much realism as possible, and this, this is an example of some of the work we did to try to calibrate the S-wave velocities near the seafloor. Um, S-wave velocity near the seafloor can be very low, and we were, we were a little bit unsure of how low it should be, but it, it, that was coupled with a question of how low S-wave velocity we could model. 
But this shows some data that we collected from various sources to try to get an idea of what realistically low S-wave velocities near the seafloor would be. We put several um, uh, reservoirs in the seam phase one model, and the reservoirs are at different depths and in different units, and they're shown here. Again, I won't go through all of them, but you can see there's a, a mix of reservoirs from turbidites to, st uh, to uh, stream channels. And, and the channels go in different directions. The lower left-hand plot is what we might consider to be an X-ray through the seam model, just showing the thickness of the reservoirs. So that the area that's white is where the re most white is where the reservoir thickness is greatest, and the, re and the region is black is where the, there is no reservoirs. So it's kind of an integrated reservoir thickness throughout the whole model. You can clearly see the east-west trending stream channels and one of the north-south trending stream channels, as well as some of the turbidites. The lower right-hand plot shows the salt body superimposed on, on that um, X-ray of the um, reservoirs within the same model. Within the reservoirs and within the, the, just the layered structure within the seam model, we tried to put realistic heterogeneity, and we, we j developed the heterogeneity using geostatistics. And this is just an example showing um, some of the properties within one of the turbidites that were generated using geostatistics. The idea was to put heterogeneity um, in the model on a scale of uh, ranging from about 20 to 50 meters and larger um, so that it would, it would um, generate something that look like realistic seismic data when we uh, calculate the seismic response from the model. This figure shows some um, logs through the model as well as some just cross-sections through the model. The left-hand side so, shows P and S-wave velocity logs um, taken at one, uh, one point in the model. You can see that the S-wave velocity is zero um, in the water and the P-wave velocity is 1,500 meters um, in the water at, at shallow depths. And then you can see that the PNS wave velocities start increasing until they hit salt. Um, on the right side, you can see various cross-sections through the model. It's the same cross-section, but we're just looking at, at different parameters, um, looking at model density, shear wave velocity, and the two components of resistivity through the model. Again, the idea was to develop things that are realistic in terms of their comparison between the geophysical properties. Unfortunately, we were unable, we realized we would be unable to model the, the low S-wave velocities that are in a realistic model. Um, our model included S-wave velocities as low as 120 meters per second, but we decided that if we tried to model that, it would drive the cost so much that we couldn't do enough simulation that, to allow us to generate a us usable data set. So we made the decision to put a lower bound on the S-wave velocity of 600 meters per second, and the way we did that is we took our original model that had velocities as low as 120 meters per second, and we basically adjusted any, any velocity between 120 meters per second and 800 meters per second to fall within a range of 600 and 800 meters per second, which is shown by the, the, um, the green curve here. And the idea was to sort of compress the scale of the S-wave velocity, but also set a lower bound on the S-wave velocity. The next plot shows the S-wave velocity as we, de as we defined it. This is, a, again, a horizontal, I mean, sorry, an east-west vertical cross-section through the model showing the S-wave velocity as we designed it, having velocities as low as 120 meters per second near the seafloor. After adjustment, the next slide shows the S-wave velocity model that we got. And here the minimum S-wave velocity um, below the water is 600 meters per second. And you can see if we go back and forth how we've, we've compress the velocity scale within regions where the S-wave velocity is low, but still tried to maintain some of the, the heterogeneity within the S-wave velocity model. Prior to doing acquisition, the, the uh, simulation, we did a lot of testing on the model. For each acquisition, we did, we did some testing to see what would be a reasonable set of acquisition parameters. And this shows some pictures of some work done by Tim Bryce on the acoustic model that we did as, as part of the acquisition design. Uh, where we're looking at, at how, how much time do we need to simulate for um, for each shot and, and what, what offset do we need to simulate for each shot. Um, Tim wrote a paper about this that, that appears on the leading edge several years ago. Another issue that was really important to see was to get an understanding of how good, the, what, how good was the quality of the numerical simulations that we were getting when we, when we simulated the SEAM model. 
and we, we did this through different approaches for different simulations, but this shows an example of the acoustic simulation, how we did it. Um, in this, for the acoustic simulation, we hired Bill Symes group at Rice University to develop a benchmark simulation code um, that was well-tested and well-calibrated, and we used that code to compare against what we got from vendor simulations. And here we're showing just an overlay of the, the simulations done by Bill Symes group in green with those done by the vendor who did the acoustic simulations on the model in red, just to show the good comparison between the two. And this is something, we did comparisons like this throughout the scene phase one project to try to be better understand how good was the quality of the numerical simulations. I'm now going to show two slides that just kind of run through the simulation parameters. I won't go through these um, individually, but what, what we're listing in each row are the the main simulations that we did, you can see variable density acoustic, variable density acoustic with an absorbing upper surface, gravity, controlled source EM. And in the next slide, you can see other simulations such as the TTI simulation, the magnetotelluric, and the, and the elastic simulations. We define here the model, the sources we used, and other information about the simulation. All these simulations are now complete. The types of data that we've generated are, are given here. Uh, for acoustic, we've got just receivers recorded near the, near the surface. For the controlled source EM, we use C4 receivers um, and also C4 sources. For gravity, we just calculated the natural gravity response uh, from the density model. For the tilted transverse isotropy model, uh, we, we actually instead we collected not only surface receivers, but we collected four component vertical seismic profile data in each of four wells in the model. For the magnetotelluric simulation, again, it's, a, it's a, a calculating the natural response of the model, and we used um, a set of about 1,300 C4 receivers. And finally, for the elastic simulation, we not only collected data that looks like the TTI that had surface simulations and the VSP data, but we also collected four component data on the C4. The sources, um, this is just to show um, the kind of sources we used. For all the seismic simulations, we used the same source pulse, and the pulse is shown on the upper right-hand plot. Uh, instead of defining the actual source pulse, what we defined is what the far-field pulse shape should look like, and that's shown here. And we asked the vendors to put in the appropriate model, the appropriate source time history within their model to give us that, within their simulation code, to give us that far-field pulse shape. The lower right-hand plot shows the spectrum of that far-field pulse shape, and you can see that we've got um, spectral content between about 2 hertz and about 25 hertz. So that we use the same pulse shape for all the, acoustic, for all the seismic simulations. Um, again, for, for the other simulations, it was mainly natural response or an active source. Controlled source EM was a horizontal electric dipole placed near the, uh, the C4 uh, that was activated at 11 different periods. The magnetotelluric is a natural source, uh, and we measured the response at 20 periods. And gravity, again, it's just the density model. I'm going to run through a series of slides now just showing east-west gathers um, from, different from different seismic simulations to show how they compare. The gathers are all for sources at almost identical location. Um, in fact, they are identical except for the acoustic one, which is off by about uh, maybe 75 meters. But what I want to do is focus a little bit on the differences between the simulations to show some of the rich content that we can get out of these different simulations. The first one I'm going to show is the upper assobing upper surface, um, surface acoustic simulation. Um, this one sort of gives the simplest response because there's no free surface multiples. And, and again, this, has, this data set has many uses that you could probably figure out yourself, but I've listed a few here. The next slide I'm going to show is the, um, the free surface. And, and if, if I go back and forth, you can see that what the free surface simulation has done is add a lot of, a lot of um, phases to the, the gather. And those are the free surface mul uh, multiples. And those add a lot of complication to the data set, but those make the data set much more realistic and more of a, challenging, a challenge for imaging. The next slide shows the free surface, the same free surface slide, but what I want you to do is to focus on a different phase there. And it's a phase that's somewhat, it's somewhat long offset from the source. 
and we're going to compare it with the TTI simulation, which is in this slide. And what you can see is that the, the arrival time has changed a little bit. And again, that's because the TTI, um, the anisotropy uh, component of the TTI makes things, particularly at long offset, have different arrival times. Finally, um, to show just with the free surface elastic, again, that's going to be the most complicated data set. And this shows um, just the response, again, with, with at the same, roughly the same source location and same receiver locations as we got for the other simulations. This shows the gravity data. Um, we're showing the, verti the, the big plot in the lower left-hand corner is the uh, vertical component of acceleration due to gravity for, uh, for the model. And the other um, six plots in the right-hand part of the slide uh, show the, the full gravity tensor response. This plot shows the CSEM data, and, um, or, or a, a portion of the CSEM data, controlled source EM. And basically, CSEM data are sensitive to shallow res reservoirs uh, due to the high resistivity of the shallow reservoirs. In the upper left-hand corner, you see the, the plot that we showed before of the cumulative reservoir thickness, like that x-ray we showed previously. In the middle upper slide, we see um, the re reservoir resistivity, or the horizontal resistivity at 2.5 kilometers depth. And you can see a region there that's circled in red where the high resistivity is caused by the reservoir penetrating that depth. In, in the other four plots, uh, boxes, you can see the uh, CSEM response. It's kind of a common offset CSEM response. And you can see that those reservoirs, um, the reservoir on, that's circled in the, in the middle upper red hand so, um, figure gives uh, a CSEM response that's circled in the blue slide, in the blue figures on the lower part of the slide, um, showing that there's some response from that, that high resistivity reservoir contained in the CSEM data. Finally, here's just a shot of the MT simulation, and I'm showing data that was done by uh, CGG um, for a period of 20 seconds. Again, we did uh, 20 periods ranging from one second to 1,000 seconds, and this is the, um, the um, XX component of the, of the um, response for the MT. Available data sets. Um, data sets are now available through SEAM. And you can obtain, if you want to get them, uh, I'll give you some information about that later, but there are um, data available for five different models, and they're listed there, the acoustic, the TTI, the elastic, the gravity, and the resistivity models. Um, you can get one of them or all of them. There's acoustic free surface data. There's absorbing upper surface seismic data. There's the tilted transverse isotropic data. There's the elastic data. Um, and there's non-seismic data, including gravity, controlled source EM, and magnetotelluric. All the data are now available. Um, a lot of the uh, data sets have been delivered to the SEAM participants. Um, they are now available to the public, and they can be purchased through SEAM. Um, not only the full data sets can be purchased, but we've also tried to break out what we call classic data set compilations um, that are shown, that are somewhat listed here. Uh, for example, shots on a 600-meter grid that cover um, the entire model for all the seismic surveys, um, or narrow azimuth or wide azimuth streamer surveys com comprised from the seismic data sets. Uh, you can also get gravity, magnetotelluric, and CSEM data separately. Um, and the model is available in various uh, versions. In conclusion, SEAM Phase 1 has provided geophysical data on an unprecedented scale. We've got several tens of terabytes of data available. Most of it is compressed by about a factor of 10 to 1, so it's several hundred terabytes of data when it's uncompressed. The model is robust, and, and many think that the model is, is maybe the most valuable part of the SEAM Phase uh, 1 project. It's been put in the format and made available to users in a way that they could easily extend it for other uses or for other simulations that they might do on their own. Um, we think it's geologically consistent um, both for the rock properties and the reservoir properties. Um, and the numerical data sets are available for use in, in various um, 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 research applications that I think the um, applications are left to the creativity of the users. Finally, I'd like to acknowledge the Research Partnership to Secure Energy for America for support. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the 24 SEAM participating companies. Um, the, in particular, the, the participating company representatives. SEAM was a collaborative project between uh, not only myself and others at SEG, uh, who are employed by or 
under the guise of SEAM, but also the participating representatives um, to the management committee, um, also the vendors who, who did work under the under contract of SEAM, as well as the SEAM board of directors. Um, and this is a listing of the SEAM Phase 1 participants. Thank you. SEAM Phase 1 participants, Anna Darko, BHP Billiton, CGG, Chevron, ConocoPhillips, Devon, EMGS, ENI, ExxonMobil, Geotrace, Hess, Ion, Landmark, Maersk, Marathon Oil, Petrobra, Nexon, PGS, Repsol, Rock Solid Images, Sigma 3, Stat Oil, Total, Western GECO, Seam received a $2,600,000 contract from RIPC to expand the Phase 1 project with additional models and simulations. RIPC subcontract number 07121-2001. Seam vendors include Halliburton, Western GECO, Sandia National Laboratories, Advanced Geophysical Technology, EMGS, CGG, Rice University, Midland Valley, and NanoSize. We definitely see the benefits to SEAM. We have found tremendous value in testing survey design methods and in testing forward modeling and depth imaging algorithms by Peter Wang, Western GECO. SEAM produces results. Data to be licensed in 2013. 40 by 35 by 15 km model. 62,478 free surface acoustic shots, 2,403 absorbing surface shots, up to 436,921 traces per shot, 200 terabyte uncompressed data, 11 classic data sets. RIPC expansion with $2.6 million subcontract under US DOE contract and complete project documentation. For more information on licensing the data or on SEAM, please go to www.seg.org slash SEAM. Want to learn more? Visit www.seg.org slash SEAM or email SEAM at seg.org. RIPC believes that investment in this program is rewarding for the entire industry, and SEG is the perfect vehicle to bring industrial partners together to develop a model that's useful to all, by Bill Head, RIPC. Available now, the SEAM Phase 1 model and data are now available to the general public for license. For more details, please visit www.seg.org SEAM. Hello and welcome to SEAM. My name is Michael Restaglio. I'm an exploration seismologist and senior research scientist in the Department of Geology and Geophysics at Yale University and the project manager for SEAM Phase 2. I will be guiding you through this presentation on the second consortium of petroleum industry companies organized by the Society of Exploration Geophysicists to address challenges of modeling seismic and other geophysical exploration methods at a realistic scale a scale that is faithful to the full scale of modern 3D geophysical exploration. The theme chosen for SEAM Phase 2 is land seismic challenges, a natural follow-up to the enormously successful Phase 1 project that focused on modeling of deep water marine seismic exploration with tertiary basins in the Gulf of Mexico as the type area for the models. SEAM Phase 1 formally completed its work this past summer which means that the models and data created in Phase 1 will soon be in the public domain. If you are interested in the results of Phase 1, there is another presentation at this booth that covers the Phase 1 project. You can also ask Jan Madol, the SEG coordinator uh, for SEAM Corporation, and one of the other booth, or one of the other booth attendants for information about the models and data from Phase 1 that are now available from SEG. This presentation on SEAM Phase 2 runs for about 25 minutes, and we'll introduce you to the three models that the Phase 2 consortium is constructing to represent different challenges of land seismic exploration. The models come from three distinct type areas. The unconventional model is based on the geology of mid-continent basins and represents the challenges of imaging and characterizing subtle stratigraphic features 
including the sweet spots containing gas and liquid, liquids and fractured shale reservoirs. The type area for the unconventional model is the Arcoma Basin of Central North America, with the shale reservoirs based on features of the Eagleford and Woodford shale gas plays. The added model includes these same shale features at depth, but places the features uh, beneath other characteristics, uh, such as karts and wadis, found in the near surface, that is, the first 500 meters of the subsurface, um, in desert terrains. The type area for the arid model is the Saudi Arabia Peninsula. Finally, the foothills model represents the deep structural complexities and highly variable near surface features that are often found in the fold and thrust belts of compressive tectonic zones, such as the foothills of the Andes Mountains in South America, which in fact is the type area for the foothills model. Phase two began in 2011. As you will see in this presentation, the three geologic models are nearly complete in digital form. Large-scale numerical simulations on the unconventional model began during the summer. Simulations on the arid model are planned to start in January, followed by the foothills model in the summer of next year. Phase two is expected to finish its project by the end of 2014. It is still possible to join the phase two consortium, and if you are interested in one or all of the phase two models, please talk with one of the booth attendants. Before talking about the models themselves, it is worth spending a few minutes on the motivation for picking land size and challenges of the theme for phase two. At the end of the presentation, we will look briefly at some of the challenges in seismic modeling that phase two is addressing. But first, why land seismic for scene phase two? The simple answer is that most of the world's remaining hydrocarbons are, in fact, onshore. Estimates are that up to two-thirds of the world's remaining conventional oil and gas reserves are located or will be found on land. A large fraction of these conventional reserves, of course, are in the giant reservoirs of the Middle East, Russia, and Southwest Asia. There are, however, significant land reserves remaining to be discovered in many areas of the globe, as represented in this map from Wikipedia, that is based on estimates made in 2009. But unconventional oil and gas resources are now just one part of the global hydrocarbon picture. Unconventional resources around the world are now being found and tapped by the technologies of 3D seismic, horizontal drilling, and hydraulic fracturing. These resources, shale gas, shale liquids, tar sands, and oil shale, are transforming world energy markets. And when unconventional resources are included in the tally, the fraction of remaining hydrocarbons on land becomes overwhelming. Partly because of this shale revolution, land seismic activity has been on the increase steadily around the world. This renewed interest in land seismic was part of the motivation for seeing phase two. Another reason for picking land seismic as the theme for phase two is that modeling land seismic data acquisition in a realistic way has its own set of challenges, often very different from those of marine seismic acquisition. The main difference between marine and land seismic lies, of course, in the medium that hosts the seismic sources and receivers. In marine seismic, depicted on the left in this slide, Sources and receivers are moving continuously through water, a medium that supports only compressional waves. Seawater, moreover, is isotropic and, for all practical purposes, homogeneous at the frequencies and wavelengths used in seismic exploration. The continuous motion of the transmu transducers in marine acquisition creates its own set of logistics challenges, especially when the sea state is rough. But operation in water usually allows a rapid acquisition of large volumes of marine seismic data in complex acquisition patterns. In land seismic, shown here on the right, sources and receivers, by contrast, are generally fixed for each individual shot. And with the exception of dynamite sources, seismic transducers on land are directional in character, including vertical and horizontal vibra size shakers and three-component geophones. More important, the medium in which the sources and receivers sit on land is inherently elastic supporting both compressional and shear waves. In fact, the near surface on land can be highly anisotropic with very different wave speeds in different directions. And nearly always, it is heterogeneous in composition on scales ranging from meters to kilometers. 
In addition, the topography on land, especially in desert terrains and foothills regions, poses enormous challenges to seismic data acquisition and processing. But even when the topography is flat and the near surface is more or less homogeneous, land seismic data has a different character than marine data. The right side of the slide shows a numerical simulation of land seismic data in a standard split spread configuration with a vertical point source, the physical model for a vibra size source, at the center of a spread of vertical component geophones as depicted on the left. The simulation on the right, in fact, comes from the quality control checks run on an early version of the unconventional model. The data is presented in a standard grayscale display coding seismic amplitude with positive and negative offset from the source running horizontally across the page and time increasing vertically down the page. Some features of the seismic data are instantly recognizable. For example, the linear events highlighted in black are the direct body waves, pressure or P waves in this example, uh, emanating in both directions from the source. Also clearly visible are curved reflection events coming from deeper interfaces in the model. The event boxed in red is the reflection from the top of the main shale gas reservoir in the unconventional model. In this model, the reservoir sits underneath a high velocity limestone layer, which generates a strong reflection at the interface. The key events that distinguish land seismic data from marine data are the large amplitude slow moving linear events highlighted in blue. These are surface waves that are generated at the Earth air interface and travel slowly along the Earth's surface. These events that are present in the simulation are mainly Rayleigh surface waves, which combine P and S wave motion in a way that generates elliptical particle motion as the wave passes by. In other models, particularly with horizontally polarized sources and receivers, a second type of surface wave called a love wave will be present. The love wave is a kind of trapped SH wave whose particle motion is purely horizontal. As you can see in the display, the slow moving surface waves run directly through the reflection events at mid-range offsets and are therefore a source of coherent noise. In addition, the highly curved diffraction event branching off from the linear surface wave, especially in the right-hand portion of the display, is highlighted by the green arrow, are generated by local heterogeneity, that is, lateral velocity variations in the first few hundred meters of the subsurface that scatter surface waves. The scattering of surface waves by lateral changes in the subsurface often severely disrupts land seismic data. Here is an extreme example from an actual seismic survey collected in the Middle East and provided courtesy of Western GECO, one of the consortium members. The data show on the right, again from a standard split spread profile with a vibra size source and vertical geophones, is nearly incoherent. This is not a problem of random noise. The data is entirely repeatable from shot to shot. It just looks chaotic. What is causing this extreme disruption of the raw data? As you can see in the display above the seismic data in black, and in the photo of the survey area on the left, there is moderate topography in the area, but this is probably not the source of the problem. Just below the surface, however, are literally hundreds and thousands of shallow karsts. These are voids in the subsurface created when percolating groundwater dissolves limestone bedrock. The karsts come in all shapes and sizes and outcrop at the surface, as shown in the photo inset at the middle. In areas where the water table is low, as in many desert, desert regions, cars can be air filled even at significant depth, which makes for large velocity contrast and large amplitude seismic scattering. Is the, is the scattering of seismic energy by cars strong enough to generate the nearly incoherent data shown at the right? One of the goals of phase two is to answer questions such as this by building realistic models of cars fields based on field examples and simulating what 3D seismic data looks like when air or water-filled cars are present in the subsurface. Here is another example where land seismic data is completely disrupted by scattering of surface wave energy. In this example, the data on the right were provided by the oil company Total, another consortium member, from one of its exploration campaigns in the foothills of the Andes Mountains in Colombia, South America. 
in this example, the first arrivals are relatively coherent, but the surface wave train completely obscures the middle section of the data. The display on the left shows the rough topography on the survey area, which has changes in elevation of up to one kilometer, occurring over distances of a few hundred meters. A later slide in this presentation shows some preliminary results from the phase two foothills model. These results suggest that the disruption visible in the data on the right is actually caused by surface waves interacting both with topography and with lateral velocity variation in the near surface. Neither feature, topography alone nor lateral velocity variation alone, appears to be sufficient to cause the jumble of amplitudes visible in the middle section of the data on the right. Land seismic data is clearly different from marine data, but how is it different precisely? The list of possible complications from karst and extreme topography to unconsolidated crusted or water-saturated soils is virtually endless. Two key goals of seen phase two are to quantify the ways in which this near-surface heterogeneity affects real land seismic data and to provide guidance to geophysicists and engineers designing the next generation of data acquisition equipment and survey patterns to reduce the problems of near-surface noise and land seismic exploration. But near-surface complexity is just one of the challenges of modern land seismic exploration. A major role of 3D seismic in the development of unconventional reservoirs is characterization of the reservoir itself. Shale gas reservoirs, such as the Barnett in Texas, the Marcellus in Pennsylvania, as well as liquid-rich shales, such as the Eagleford and Bakken clays in Texas and North Dakota, extend over very large geographic areas. These geologic formations are not difficult to find or to hit with the drill bit. The real challenge in unconventional development is often that of remotely characterizing the reservoir with seismic data before drilling starts. Features such as the orientation and density of natural fractures and shale formations are known to be correlated with sweet spots in the reservoirs. In addition, the mechanical integrity of the rock, for example, whether it is brittle or ductile, is relevant to the design of stimulation programs by hydraulic fracturing and to the design of well completion. All of these mechanical properties of shale can have detectable seismic signatures, even total organic content, which is critical to the productivity of shale gas reservoirs, may be correlated with physical properties that can affect the amplitude and speed of seismic waves illuminating shale formation. The question is, can these subtle effects be seen reliably in land seismic data? The simulations in the next two slides show that under good but realistic conditions, the effects of subtle fractures in shale reservoirs can in fact be seen in land seismic data. These simulations are again taken from the quality control runs on the unconventional model, which contains two fractured shale reservoirs juxtaposed at depth with limestone beds. The prominent reflection events running across the middle of the profile represent reflections from the interface between the shale and limestone beds. The first slide shows a reference simulation in which the characteristic anisotropy associated with vertical fractures in the shale is, admitted, is omitted from the model. The second slide shows the simulation with the full anisotropy of highly laminated fracture shale included in the model. I'm going to toggle back and forth between these two slides so you can see the differences. Reference simulation, simulation with full anisotropy. Again, reference simulation, simulation with full anisotropy. I'll now highlight one of the areas where the differences are large. Simulation with full anisotropy, reference simulation. Full anisotropy, reference simulation. The far offsets are the most affected, but there are differences even in the middle portions of the section. Again, one of the goals of seeing phase two is to quantify these differences with realistic geologic models built from real world analogs. These goals for Team Phase 2 were set during a series of meetings and surveys of potential consortium members organized by SEG early in 2011 to start the STEAM Phase 2. All of the eventual members agreed that the two overarching goals for Phase 2 would be the use of 3D elastic wave modeling first to better define the trade-offs in land seismic data acquisition, and second, to enhance the state-of-the-art 
in land seismic data processing, imaging, and inversion. The next generation of land seismic acquisition patterns and equipment, especially in connection with exploration for complex unconventional reservoirs, are now on the drawing board and are expected to break the million channel barrier within the next decade. To achieve these goals, Team Phase 2 will have to push the state of the art in elastic wave modeling to include new methods that can handle with higher accuracy features such as extreme topography, anisotropic elastic parameters of fractured media, as well as viscoelastic effects, that is, attenuation of seismic energy, especially in unconsolidated near surface materials. Getting the attenuation right is important to mimicking the amplitudes of events seen in the real seismic data. There are now 22 companies in the same Phase II consortium, Anadarko, CMTC, BGP, BHP Billiton, BP, CGG Veritas, Chevron, NE, ExxonMobil, Global Geophysical, ION, GX Technology, Hess, Marathon Oil, Occidental, Oxy, Repsol, Saudi Aramco, Shell, Sinopec, Stat Oil, Talisman, Total, Tullo Oil, and Slumberger, Western Tico. Phase two is organized along the lines established by the successful phase one consortium. SEAM itself is a not-for-profit entity incorporated in the state of Oklahoma. SEAM Corp is wholly owned by SEG, but has its own independent board of directors that reports to the SEG board. Different projects or consortia are organized under, under the SEAM structure. SEAM phase one began in 2007, and just this past July, formally concluded its project. Phase two began in 2011, and it's expected to continue through 2014. Each project has its own management committee, composed of one representative from each of the member companies. The management committee plans and oversees all project-related decisions, taking input from the technical committees that are also composed of representatives from the member companies. There is no limitation on the number of members from a given company that can serve on any of the technical committees. A project manager under contract to SEG and SEAM reports to the board and works with the management committee to accomplish project goals. Full and part-time staff at SEG provide administrative support. Many project tasks, such as model building, are undertaken by voluntary efforts in the technical committees, but large production simulations are carried out by contract, under contract with vendors after a competitive bidding process. There are four technical committees in SEAM Phase Two. The Near Surface Geologic Modeling Committee is chaired by Tim Kehoe of Saudi Aramco. The Subsurface Geologic Modeling Committee is chaired by Ray Barrett of DP, with Charles Sicking of Global Geophysical acting as co-chair. The Acquisition and Processing Committee is chaired jointly by Kyle Llewellyn of ExxonMobil and by Steve Knapp of Hess. The Numerical Design Committee is chaired by Kunshan Zhang of Repsol. The Management Committee for Phase Two is chaired by Gladys Gonzalez, also of Repsol. This year, Gladys is also serving her term as president of EAGE, the European Association of Geoscientists and Engineers. In the next series of slides, we will look more closely at the three models under construction in phase two. Although geologic model construction is a joint activity involving all member companies, each model has its particular champions. The unconventional model was largely the work of BP under the direction of Ray Barrett, Carl Ragoni built the structural and stratigraphic framework for the model using geologic modeling software available to BP. The near surface region of the ARID model represents mainly the efforts of Tim, K Tim Keo of Saudi Aramco, working with Peter Wang of Western GECO, using Petrel geologic modeling software provided by Slumberjack. Finally, the Foothill, Foothills model is the first seen geologic model to be built under outside contract. Repsol provided a series of geologic horizons from an exploration project in South America, and these horizons would eventually form the structural framework for the Foothills model. Total provided a near-surface velocity cube and topography from the Lanhos Foothills in Colombia that will occupy the first 500 meters of the Foothills model. The digital model itself is now being finalized by a small company called Midland Valley Exploration using its 3D MOVE geologic modeling software. These three models, the unconventional model, the arid model, and the foothills model, represent a wide range of structural and stratigraphic features in both the near surface and subsurface. Several stratigraphic features in the subsurface are the theme of the unconventional and arid models, complex fold, 
and structural features are the theme of the Foothills model. Each model has its own unique near surface features based on their specific geologic type areas. The unconventional model is based on the near surface and stratigraphy of a mid-continent basin patterned after the Arcoma Basin, which hosts the Woodford Shale. At depth, this model also contains elements of the Eagleford Shale play of the Gulf of Mexico. The near surface of the added model is based on features found in the desert environments of the Saudi Arabian Peninsula. And the near surface of the Foothills model, including its topography, is based on features encountered in the foothills of the Llanos Basin of Colombia, South America. Information about the petroleum geology of these type areas is readily available online. The website of the U.S. Geological Survey, usgs.gov, has extensive information about the Arcoma Basin and the Woodford and Eagleford shale gas plays. An excellent article on the geology and tectonic history of the Llanos Basin in Columbia can be found in the archives of the Bulletin of the American Association of Petroleum Geologists on the AAPG website. And the public website of Saudi Aramco, SaudiAramcoWorld.com, has a wealth of information on the geology and desert environments of the Saudi Arabia Peninsula. While the structural and stratigraphic framework of the phase two models are based on specific type areas, the elastic properties assigned to the models are derived from petrophysical relationships that represent the contributions of nearly all the consortium members. In this way, the specific elastic properties needed for numerical simulations, BPVS, density, and attenuation, or the parameters that define the anisotropy of fractured shale reservoirs can be traced back to particular combinations of rock properties, such as the volume fraction of shale and shaley sand layers, porosity, pore pressure, fluid saturation, the regional stress state, and other relevant features of the rocks. This approach to model building was pioneered and seen in phase one and continued in phase two. A novel step in model building introduced in phase two was the use of numerical stratigraphy to mimic the stratigraphic setting of particular reservoirs. This new approach to creating geologic models was developed at BP and is the basis for the program that Carl Rigoni of BP used to build the subsurface of the unconventional and arid models. The numerical process proceeds by first defining spatial and temporal, temporal probability distributions for shan, sand and shale sediments and their mixtures based on available data, such as seismic well laws and geologic maps, for a particular type area or a collection of type areas. The program then uses these distributions, along with a set of geologic rules, to simulate deposition of layers making up the stratigraphic section. A typical rule, for example, is that new sand channels can cut into underlying shale layers, but not vice versa. For the unconventional model, the simulation deposited 15,000 distinct layers of sediments in 25 centimeter depths, with the deposition of each layer varying laterally according to the predetermined probability distribution. After the detailed depositional model was constructed, a separate step followed in which the two shale reservoirs and two meandering river channels were inserted as geobodies. The entire model was then cut with two faults. Finally, the near surface layers were added to form the top 300 meters of the model, based on near surface features of the Arcoma Basin. Finally, elastic properties were assigned to the model, based on petrophysical models derived from logs and core analysis from the Arcoma Basin and from the Eagleford and Woodford shale gas plate. The left side of the slide shows a 200 meter thick vertical section through the unconventional model near the top of the upper shale reservoir, the Woodford shale. The grayscale registers density. The darkest colors represent pure shale sediments, the lightest pure sandstone. Intermediate color colors represent mixtures. The model is displayed at 25 to 1 vertical exaggeration to highlight details and what are actually subtle lateral variations of stratigraphic features of the model. The right side of the slide shows the horizontal section at the level of the top shale reservoir, in which 34 geobodies of different types represent zones of different properties, including sweet spots in the reservoir. There are actually four different types of geobodies in the model, representing zones of ductile or brittle rock properties combined with high or low gas content. The full model is shown here in a section with no vertical exaggeration to emphasize the fine scale stratigraphy of the unconventional model. 
The model is 10 kilometers by 10 kilometers in horizontal extent and 3.75 kilometers in depth. The digital representation of the model has been discretized in uniform blocks, 6.25 meters on each side. In this representation and this display, the meandering stream channels in the upper portions of the stratigraphic section, along with the two high angle faults, are clearly visible. This slide shows vertical logs in the background elastic properties, VC, VS, and density taken from the center of the model, superimposed on the general trend of increasing velocity. Swift depths are the variations imposed by the stratigraphic model alternating sand and shale beds. The two shale reservoirs bracket the high velocity layer near the base of the model. This layer has the properties of the famous Austin Chalk limestone formation, which overlies the Eagle Fruit Shale at its base. These background elastic properties are the starting point for a final refinement of the unconventional model that adds the elastic anisotropy characteristic of finely layered and fractured shale beds. As mentioned earlier, an important goal for the unconventional model is to use it as a test bed for studies of whether seismic surveys can accurately characterize the elastic properties of shale reservoirs before the drill bit arrives. In the unconventional model, these anisotropic properties are represented in what has become the standard in, geo in exploration geophysics. The full anisotropy of the elastic medium is built from a combination of two different types of transverse isotropy. In transverse isotropy, the medium is invariant under rotation about an axis of symmetry. In the first type, called vertical transverse isotropy, or VTI, the axis of symmetry is vertical, and seismic velocities vary as the propagation angle varies from vertical to horizontal. In the second type, called horizontal transverse isotropy, the axis of symmetry is horizontal and seismic velocities range as the propagation direction varies in the horizontal plane, going, for example, from traveling in the north-south direction to traveling in the east-west direction. Mathematically, these properties are encoded in the elasticity matrix for what is called an orthorhombic anisotropic medium. In the unconventional model, the elasticity matrix depicted here is built from the well-known Thompson parameters that are a convenient way of representing the weak anisotropy characteristic of rock formations. As shown earlier, test simulations carried out in phase two have demonstrated that high quality land seismic data with good signal to noise ratio is visibly affected by the presence of subtle anisotropy found in fractured shale reservoirs. We will show in a later slide how simulations to be carried out in phase two will test how well these features hold up as the signal to noise ratio degrades. Again, reference simulation, simulation with full anisotropy. Reference simulation, full anisotropy. Modeling modern seismic surveys at full scale does not just mean detailed large scale geologic models, it also means large scale surveys. Production simulations on the unconventional model have just begun under outside contract, and the phase two consortium plans to collect a numerical 3D data set consisting of more than 20,000 shots over the unconventional model, with synthetic data being recorded at over 1 million three-component receivers for each shot. Uncompressed, the complete data set for the unconventional model will represent several hundred terabytes of raw data. One final ingredient in the unconventional model is the realistic representation of seismic attenuation. Tests run by Carl Rigoni of BP, like the one shown in this slide, indicate that intrinsic, that is, anelastic attenuation of shear, shear wave stress, must be included in numerical simulation to reproduce the balance between the amplitudes of body waves and surface waves seen in field data. The left panel shows a simulation in which no attenuation is included in the model, and the slow-moving surface waves completely dominate the seismic section. More realistic and comparable to field data is the simulation shown in the right panel in which attenuation of shear stress is included in the near surface layers. This reduces the amplitudes of the surface waves compared to the body waves and represents a more realistic balance of energy between surface and body waves. This slide summarizes the parameters of the unconventional model. Most of these features have already been discussed, but one final aspect of the simulation, the final bullet point, is worth mentioning. In order to test the robustness of seismic data processing methods to variations in the signal-to-noise ratio of seismic data, 
the numerical simulations will be run twice. In the first step, the full model, 10 kilometers by 10 kilometers in horizontal extent and 3.75 kilometers in depth, will be shot and recorded as shown in the panel on the left. In the second step, just the near surface portion of the model, consisting of the first 300 meters, will be shot with an absorbing boundary condition at the base. This model will rep represent the response of just the near surface region. Subtracting the response of the near surface region from the full model leaves the response of the reflectors in the subsurface region below 300 meters, below the near surface, as shown in the panel on the right. This process will allow the signal from the subsurface to be recombined with the near surface response at different signal to noise levels to test the robustness of seismic processing methods, including imaging schemes and quantitative seismic conversion methods. The simple example shown in this slide illustrates how a seismic image of the faults and meandering stream channel in the upper portion of the unconventional model degrades as the signal to noise ratio in the data goes from 0 dB, representing strong subsurface signal in the presence of near surface scattering, to minus 20 dB, representing a model in which near surface scattering dominates the subsurface response. Let's now look briefly at the other two models under construction in phase two. The ARID model uses the same reservoir and stratigraphy as the unconventional model, but replaces the first 500 meters with complex near surface features encountered in desert terrain. The ARID model will include features such as buried karst and wadis, stream channels, outcropping reflectors, and unconsolidated sediments near the surface. A version of the ARID model will also include the surface topography characteristic of sand dunes and desert mountains. Numerical simulation of buried karsts is a special challenge for the ARID model. The digital representation of a karst field in the ARID model is based on actual seismic images collected above deeply buried karsts in the Saudi Arabian Peninsula. The, slide on the, right, the panel on the right is a seismic image, a horizontal slice through a seismic image, uh, at about a depth of 200 meters through a 3D seismic section provided to the consortium by Saudi Aramco. The prominent dark circles are the tops of extremely large cars several hundred meters in diameter. The numerous smaller circular features are literally thousands of smaller cars of various sizes populating this karst field at all depths in the model. The panel on the left shows a horizontal slice through a simulation of a shallow karst field in an early version of the ARID model. The sizes, shapes, and distribution of karsts here shown in black were based on the pattern seen in the seismic image on the previous slide. The ultimate goal of the ARID model is to simulate accurately the response of air-filled karsts in order to reproduce as closely as possible the actual conditions encountered in desert regions. But representing voids in the subsurface is a major challenge for the current generation of seismic modeling codes. As a compromise, the panel on the right shows test simulations in which karsts are filled with water as would hold in wet regions below the groundwater table. Events generated by reverberations within the water-filled karst structures, excited by passing surface waves, begin to mimic disruptive features seen in actual surveys over shallow karst fields. The near-surface arid model is being built at the collaboration between Saudi Aramco and Western GECO using the Petrel geologic modeling platform. As with the unconventional model, key features of the ARID model, such as the karst fields and buried wadis, will be represented as discrete geo bodies to facilitate their digital manipulation. Construction of the ARID model will be finished in the fall of this year with production simulations planned for the start of 2014. The last model under construction in phase two is the Foothills model, which represents the challenges of land seismic exploration and mountainous terrain. The type area for the Foothills model is the Llanos Basin of Columbia. The model itself is a collaboration between the oil companies Repsol and Total, as working as members of the Phase II consortium and working in collaboration with the structural geology experts of Midland Valley Exploration under contract to Seam Phase II. <coughs>
The key features of the Foothills model are complex fold and thrust structures at depth, overlain by the rough topography and rapid lateral velocity variation found in mountainous foothills of compressive tectonic zones, such as the Andes region of South America. The Foothills model is the largest of the three geologic models in phase two and covers the region 15 kilometers by 12 and a half kilometers in lateral extent and seven and a half kilometers in depth. This model combines rugged topography with elevation differences of up to 1,000 meters over several hundred meters, combined with rapid variations in seismic velocity in the shallow subsurface, corresponding to zones of alluvial fill and strongly weathered layers in the valleys and outcropping bedrock near the topographic highs. The horizontal and vertical sections of the velocity cube of the Foothills model, which was provided by Total, illustrate the strong heterogeneity and compressional wave velocity in the first 500 meters of the subsurface, ranging from velocities as low as 1,000 meters to velocities as high, velocities as, high as 4,000 meters per second. The, arrow, the arrows highlight the areas of low velocity alluvial fill contrasting with high velocity outcropping bedrock. As mentioned before, test simulations performed by Total showed that strong surface wave scattering at levels high enough to disrupt the coherence of a shock data are not easily generated by topography alone. The panel on the left shows a simulation for a model in which there are large differences in elevation along the section, but in which the velocity model more or less follows the topography. The raw seismic data shown at the bottom left are complex but interpretable. Direct waves, surface waves, and reflection events are clearly visible. In contrast, the panel on the right shows what happens when large lateral fluctuations of shear wave velocity are introduced in a region extending about 100 meters below the topography. Interaction between surface wave scattering from lateral velocity variation and surface wave scattering by the topography completely disrupts the seismic data after the arrival of the surface wave. Ultimately, the goal of the Foothills model is to understand how to unravel this near surface scattering, which is clearly visible in the data. To image and to image the complex structural features found at depth in compressive tectonic zones. This concludes the presentation on the three phase two geologic models. The computational goal of seeing phase two is to push numerical modeling of seismic data to its limits with the best algorithms currently available running on the fastest and largest modern computers. The algorithms will use the most general form of elastic anisotropy, include viscoelastic attenuation where necessary, and will represent structural features such as topography and extreme velocity contrast. To recap, Scene Phase 2 started in 2001 and now has 22 participants. Three models have been constructed by the technical committees working in Scene Phase 2, the unconventional model, the arid model, and the foothills model. Production simulations on the unconventional model started in July, simulations on the arid model, and on the Foothills model will follow at approximately six month intervals. This slide shows the working schedule for steam phase two. Again, simulations on the unconventional model started in the summer. Simulations for the arid model will begin early in 2014 and run through the middle of next year. And simulations on the Foothills model will start in the summer of 2014 and conclude at the end of phase two, which is planned for December 2014. This concludes the presentation on scene phase two, with grateful acknowledgement of the contributions of the 22 member companies and their representatives on the management and technical committees. For further information about scene, please contact one of the booth attendants. Thank you. Seam vendors include Halliburton, Western GECO, Sandia National Laboratories, Advanced Geophysical Technology, EMGS, CGG, Rice University, Midland Valley, and NanoSize. Our interest is for R&D to create improved imaging. We also see many research papers coming out of these efforts for years to come resulting in algorithm development.
This benefits the entire industry by Kevin Bishop, KB Size. Hello, my name is Bill Abriel, past vice president of the SEG and one of the founding members of SEAM. It is my pleasure to speak to you about the SEG Advanced Mobile Corporation. The purpose of SEAM is to generate large-scale numerical simulations that first advance geophysical innovation. Secondly, address grand challenges of exploration and reservoir geophysics. Thirdly, provide a collaborative working environment for researchers. And finally, focus on specific deliverables to further the art of science of geophysics. SEAM is a highly successful corporation that is having profound effects on the understanding of some of our greatest geophysical problems in the industry. But what is SEAM and how does it operate? First, let's cover just a little history. The concept of SEAM was initiated in 2004 by a very small band of geophysicists who envisioned the opportunity of collaborative research through a series of large-scale synthetic models intended to challenge the industry. The structure of SEAM was built on the experience of the public consortium for the 1994 SCG SALT model, the 2000 private consortium of the Smart JV for multiples, and the structure of the 1995 Deep Star Research Consortium for advancing deep water drilling and producing facilities. The SEAM project was planned from the beginning to operate over several years and in multiple phases so that many important challenges could be addressed with large-scale numerical simulations of geophysical data. I'd like to reflect on what we mean by grand challenges for the industry. One way to think of this is to define today's difficult imaging and analysis struggles. Examples are the complexities of subsalt, near surface, fractures, and 4D. Another aspect of challenge is to work with data sets that are large enough to simulate the scale of work done in the field. For example, the phase one salt model represents an area equal to 60 OCS blocks in the offshore Gulf of Mexico, comprising 60,000 shots and 450,000 traces each. This type of scale simulates actual field practices and allows for testing various acquisition options without having to repeat them in the field, which would be prohibitively expensive. And thirdly, the SEAM models address the challenge to simulate the internal and geological complexity found in live data. This includes the complex structure, stratigraphy, and properties that mimic the examples found in nature. SEAM is all about delivery. Each SEAM project is designed to address specific challenges and provide focused legacy data sets from which geophysics can experiment and test new ideas. For this purpose, the models, data acquisition, and numerical processes are well defined and documented, such that data can be used out of the box for practical research. Model designs are purposely conceived to generate complexity and scale that exceeds the present processing capabilities of the industry so that the shelf life of the simulated data will extend significantly into the future. Yet SEAM is designed to do more than simulate grand challenge data sets. The working group of participants engage in a highly collaborative environment. Projects are intentionally designed to be of a large enough scale so that any one company would be very unlikely to invest on its own. And to succeed, the group must combine its intellectual resources, bringing together ideas and research experts to bear on the problem. And SEAM's funding structure is quite unique. In order to avoid the disruption of the annual budget cycle, the cost of membership is committed over the several years of the project life and supplemented by national government grants. So the working environment is designed to operate with a minimum of political or competitive drivers. This means that creativity can be maximized and energy can be focused on the challenge. SEAM projects are intended to advance geophysical innovation, and there's no better way to do this than to address the present trade challenges head on. Through collaboration, the working group actively defines the underlying and fundamental questions which numerical simulations may be able to solve. It operates on the world frontiers of the accuracy and efficiency of numerical codes and large-scale computing resources. The opportunity to spread innovation 
is directly recognized by the SEAM members who intentionally advocate the distribution of the SEAM models and simulations into the public domain after a nominal period of proprietary use. I hope you will look deeper into the work of SEAM and its successful cooperative research efforts. The SEG is proud to be the parent of the SEAM Corporation and applauds its efforts to advance the innovation of geophysics by addressing world chaos problems. Thank you for your time and attention. SEAM partners include 24 companies in Phase 1 at $2,600,000, 22 companies in Phase 2 at $4,020,000, and RIPC U.S. Department of Energy at $2,600,000, totaling $9,220,000, providing the resources and solutions to meet tomorrow's challenges. SEAM participants include Anadarko, CNPC BGP, BHP Billiton, BP, CGG, Chevron, ConocoPhillips, Devon, EMGS, ENI, ExxonMobil, Geotrace, Global, Hess, Ion, Landmark, Maersk Oil, Marathon Oil, Nexon, Oxy, PGS, BR Petrobra, Repsol YPF, RSI, Saudi Aramco, Sigma 3, Shell, Sinopec, Stat Oil, Talisman Energy, Total, Too Low Oil, Western GECO. Available now. The SEAM Phase 1 model and data are now available to the general public for license. For more details, please visit www.seg.org slash SEAM. Coming in 2015, SEAM Phase 3. To learn more, email seam at seg.org.